Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week that you are blessed and that you are healthy and that God has smiled on you and that, you know, you are actually being useful in his service. I, I got to share this with you as we go into this morning's message. You know, I was thinking back over my life as a kid a few days ago. Um, you know, y'all have heard me talk about the story of when I, I looked forward to being an usher. I used to really desire to be, a, I said it right too, Pete, uh, an <laughs> usher. And uh, as a kid, because I used to look at him and see him at the back of the church, you know, and they they'd have their, their little black slacks on, white shirt, white gloves, you know. Sometimes they'd wear a tie and, and they would, you know, hold it. Block the doors of the church, or they open the doors, they bring it in. They also, you know, spent time with, um, you know, when it was time to receive the offering, they would bring you up. Either we would go row by row and they'd let you go, or they actually pass the collection plate, you know, that kind of thing. You know, but I thought about even further that when I was, you know, outside of the church, when working on the farm, you know, I couldn't wait to be able to be trusted enough to be useful to drive the tractor, you know. Uh, I got early, very, very early age. I was able to utilize the manual tools, you know, but to drive the motorized stuff, you know. And so I was nine or ten when I first got to drive the tractor, you know, right. But then I'd be at my dad's shop and be working on stuff and things that nature. And, and he'd drop wrenches, and I'd be wanting to go up underneath there and help, but he wouldn't let me do it. So he'd drop the wrench, and I'd run up underneath the truck and go, "Here it is, here it is," you know, because I was showing my interest in, in all this stuff, hoping one day to go, "Okay, tighten that bolt right there, or take that loose." And eventually, that finally happened, you know. He had enough trust and so forth, you know, or maybe he saw enough equipping in me that I was, could handle the job or the task. And so it was the same thing. I remember being like 11 or 12 driving my first 18-wheeler. I got to move the tractor portion, back it up out of the shop, you know. And it, I'm going to tell you, the clutch was so stiff, I had to take both feet, put on it, to push it down, to get it in the gear, and then pop off of it, and then it would rawr, 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 or it started backing up. And then if I was driving it down the road, I'd take both feet again, put it on it to get it in gear. But once it started going forward, now I get the, I've watched it so many times as a kid, dad driving, he'd run, he'd rump the RPMs and float it. He never really used the clutch after that. So therefore, even though 11 or 12, not enough leg strength in a single leg, I could get it going and run through them gears real sweet. But you see, there was some equipping that took place to get me there that he trusted that I could handle it and all this good kind of stuff. So I'm excited to share with you because I remember this piece here, you know, being a kid sitting in, in church and in the pew and watching the choir sing. And then I got to sing in the young adult choir, but the young adult choir only sung on every fourth Sunday, you know, so you really didn't get to sing that much, right? Now I couldn't sing, but I wanted to sing in the adult choir. You know, right? And so finally, when I was old enough and, or able, for whatever reason, I got to go be a part of the adult choir. And then I made it into the male portion of it where I got to stand on the back row with all the dudes. <laughs> you couldn't tell me nothing. <laughs> I sounded like a crack record, man, but I was belting it out because, see, here's the deal. All I wanted to do was to be there to serve, to be a part of it, right? And it didn't look like work. Everything I just described to you that I desired to do was my father's work. The trucks, the farm, all that, that was work. I saw it as something fun to, to go do, but it was actually work that was being done. Do you know the difference in all that was, was my perspective of it? Amen. Come on now. Amen. So now if you have your Bibles with you this morning. Ooh, it's going to be good. And turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, starting at the ninth verse. <sighs> Say amen when you have, if not, so it on me. Jeremiah chapter 1, starting at the ninth verse. So here's the thing. It says this. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I have appointed you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow and to build and to plant. Verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Verse 13, 
the word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north, I answered. Verse 14, the Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to stand and be used in service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hours come where your people have got themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer and will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in your darling son, Christ Jesus. Mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. And amen. This morning's sermon title is called, To Be Used by God. To be used by God. At the top of your outline, you're going to find the word equipping. It says equipping is what he does to get us prepared to be useful in his service. Our equipping comes from us spending intimate time in God's presence through the preaching ministry, the teaching ministry, the personal study ministry, the mentorship ministry, and the prayer ministry. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning. And I also want to say to those, to say to the overcomers of this world, good morning church. Amen. Come on now. See, often we forget that being the church means that we have overcome the world. And what I mean by that is that we are in this world, but we're not of it. Somebody needs to say something, right? Our citizenship is in heaven and such, and we should live as such in a manner that reflects where we are from. That's the peace. The Apostle Paul shares it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Somebody needs just to say a little something there, right? You see, last week we talked about God's calling. I got that, right? Be ready, be ready, right? And we tried to give some excuses. And we found out that all of us have a calling on our life in one degree or another. There's nobody that he created that he didn't put a call on the life. Amen. Right? And the simplest way to describe God's calling is to be useful in his service. Somebody needs to say That's the simplest way to say it. Right? And so, you see, when the Lord calls on us and we answer the call, because there's the two-part piece. He's calling everyone, but only a few answer. Look at y'all. And so when we answer the call, we are committing to serve him, his purpose, and his people. Come on now. And so, and God is faithful to equip us before he sends us into service. And this was true in the case of Jeremiah as well. Now remember last week, Jeremiah was like, oh, Lord, I'm only a child, right? He started talking, but he was 20-something years old, right? And so, but... Once God eliminated all of Jeremiah's excuses, he presented himself as a willing vessel and God began his equipping. This is what you're seeing this morning. God's equipping of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. And so it's in verse 9a that we see God's personal touch. And this, I got to tell you, this passage of scripture right here blesses me. It says, and then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, we're going to stop right there for a moment. Can you imagine this picture of God reaching out his hand and touching Jeremiah's lips? Can you see it? See, to me, it comes to life for me because, see, can you see the level of intimacy that's invoked in that? That God is the creator of all things has paused to come see you, to reach out and personally touch you. Now, here's the thing. God had entered into Jeremiah's personal space and was welcome not only to touch his lips, but also his soul. Somebody needs to say something. You see, it's because see, it's in this portion of the scripture. I see Jeremiah going from being called by God to being justified by God. By the Lord's touch. So for the Apostle Paul shows it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. He says, and to those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. See, I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And I'm reminded of a young man that prayed at my old church. And 
He would petition the Lord with these words, just one touch from you, Lord, and I know that all things would be all right. Hear the voice of your poor, weak, and unworthy servant. I think he's probably the reason why I pray the way I do today, because he had such a powerful prayer life. He was a deacon of the church. He sat on the front row, and he would start to pray, and everybody would be praying along with him. But then all of a sudden, something would happen in the midst of his prayer. He transcended the room into the presence of God, and his prayer life was so rich and so powerful. I remember sitting there with tears coming down just from him praying because he forgot about everybody else being in the room. That blessed me. We don't pray like that no more. Lord, have mercy. But you see, he would ask for God's personal touch. His name was Brother Hal, and he was like 90-something years young at the time. See, I'm talking about how to be used by God. Because he said, Lord, I just got a little more left. Use it, my Lord. Amen. He came in on a walker, y'all, and was still saying, Lord, just one more touch. I got a little more to give. You see, it's in verse 9 I'm still talking about that man. That's been a while ago. So it's in verse 9b that we see God equipping Jeremiah. He says, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, here's the thing. I know we wish it was that easy, that God would just come to us, touch our lips and our mouths, and then instantly the word would be found in our hearts and our mouth and our life and our actions and our speech and everything, right? Right. <sighs> Lord. And you see, but here's the thing. Remember, he said, it's just, one of the excuses Jeremiah gave was that I'm just a child and I don't know how to speak. And so God dealt with that. He said, first of all, don't tell me you're just a child. That's the first thing. Second thing is, is that he says, I know how to speak. He goes, boop, now you do. I put my word in your mouth. But see, when he put it in his mouth, he put it in his heart. Y'all get that part, right? He put it in his heart. So I want you to realize that when the scripture starts to speak about the mouth and things of that nature, he's working on what goes on the inside. Somebody to say something. And so, and he says, uh, when he put it in Jeremiah's mouth, there was no more room for any more excuses, right? Mm -hmm. right. So the source of Jeremiah's message was clearly who? The Lord. But here is the beautiful thing about this deal. But the message would be expressed through Jeremiah's personality, through his experience, and through his giftedness. So how God made Jeremiah is how the message is going to come. The source of the message is God. Oh, I love this. I love this. Because, y'all, we forget it. We keep thinking we got to be somebody else. He said, no, I created you to be this way. And because of your giftedness, because of how I made you, I'm going to use you just the way I crafted you. And you're going to be the messenger to carry my word. Because see, I love the illustration of Ezekiel's equipment as well. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Now he's equipping him. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to send you on this difficult task, but I need you to put the word in you first. Ezekiel 3.10, he says this, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. So he says, I'm going to speak it to you. I'm going to put it in you, but I need for also you to hear it for yourself. My God. I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And even today, God is still faithful to equip those he has called. And God uses many different methods in his equipping of us. Somebody to say something, right? Because we all learn differently. We all get it in different ways, right? So many of you might remember Jesus' sermon on the mount. We'll give you a small piece of it, right? You see, God has given us biblical illustrations of the different methods about how he equips us. So if you look with me at Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, you'll find one of the methods God uses to equip us, and it's the preaching ministry. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Verse 2, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Now, he was preaching this message to them on the side of the mount, right? And it was a beautiful thing because he, he was sharing with them the keys to be to get to heaven. When a man of God shares the unadulterated word of God and shares the full counsel of this word, there is equipping in the message. Somebody needs to say something. But for the equipping to take place, you have to want to receive what is being shared. Y'all get that? Yeah. See, you see, the seed God gives from his word is never bad. Somebody need to say something. The seed that comes from God's word is never bad. And if the preacher is sowing good seed and it falls on good soil, then there should be a harvest of good fruit in the lives of those who receive the seed. Somebody needs to say something. I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And so I want you to know something else. Preaching by itself is not enough. Because God has another method that goes along with preaching ministry, and it's the teaching ministry. Look with me at Acts chapter 17, verse 11, to see what the Bereans did after hearing the Apostle Paul preach a message to them. It says this, Now the Bereans were more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So they heard the preach word and it stirred them up on the inside but then they went back to the word themselves and started to dig deep within it to say, is everything he said, is it truly captured here in the word of God? Oh my Lord. You see, when a child of God stands and teaches the full counsel of God's word there is equipping in it. Now here's the key. That should lead us to search the scriptures for the treasures that are deep within the word itself. See, this is why Bible study is so important in the growth and equipping of someone God is going to use. Because here's the thing. Too often we are not useful in the service of God because we lack the understanding of his word. Somebody needs to say something. But here's the funny part. I don't mean funny. Ha ha. We will acknowledge this challenge of not understanding, but do nothing about it. Mm. Mm. Right. Amen. Come on. Mm. See, if, this, if it doesn't come easy, it's as if we say then we don't want it. Do you know in all my illustrations of the things that I desired to do as a kid, wanting to drive the tractor, wanting to work in the shop, wanting to do build race cars, all this kind of stuff, wanting to be in the choir, wanting to be able to be, a, uh, to be an usher and so forth. All those things required me to do some things, to learn some things, to be able to do those things. And so if I want to be useful by God, I got to learn some things. I got to get into the depth of some things. And I got to use those things to grow. My God. But you see, I love how the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Somebody needs to say something. I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. You see, everything we do, should do, we should do it as if we're doing it unto the Lord. Because outside of our corporate experience of study, Bible study of God's word, there is another method God uses to equip us. And it is our personal study. Come on now. Right? Most of my kids, if at any time I have given them a Bible, and it was always been a study Bible, because I didn't want them to just to read it, I wanted them to study it. I wanted them to find the love in it. I wanted them to find the grace and the mercy, and I wanted them to see the help and the strength and the encouragement when fear and difficult and troubling times come up. I gave them the best book that I could ever give them, and hopefully illustrated before them the power of that book because they saw me myself. Going to that book to be fed, to be healed, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be lifted up, to be helped up, to be lifted above all my circumstances, even though I couldn't control them. Wow. You see, in 2 Timothy 
chapter 2, verse 15, we see Paul's message to Timothy. He tells him, he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Who did he say to? Study to show thyself approved to who? God. To God. Not to man. Mm -hmm. To God. And he says, and a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So who is the, always the audience that we need to be mindful of? God. Who is the litmus test of how we started to show ourselves approved? God and his word. You see, this is one of the greatest methods around, for it is in this method that we get to be alone with the master. Come on. I'm visual in my head when I see this because, see, I've gone before his throne so many times and sat next to his feet. And had him minister to me. Had him love on me. You see, this method is a requirement for everyone. Everyone. For the Apostle Paul shares in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 and 15, these words. He says, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, obtaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love. Y'all ought to underline that, highlight it if it's not already in your Bible. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, and that is Christ. See, I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. See, here's the thing. The equipped know the truth, even though we may not know it all from Genesis to Revelation. But we must put into practice the truth we know and build on that. Somebody needs to say something. Because, see, we are called to grow into mature believers. See, many in the body of Christ are mature in age, but not in spiritual growth. Somebody needs to say something. Because, see, you see, time in the pew doesn't automatically translate to spiritual growth in the body of Christ. Come on. Come on. See, I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 11, we see another method God uses to equip us. It's the Mentor ministry. He says, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. This is Paul ministering and mentoring unto Timothy, these words. He says, verse 7, but reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Verse 8, for a bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the, the life that is now is and of that which is to come. Verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Verse 11, these things command and teach. See, I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And so the Mentoring ministry is walking with someone that has a greater understanding of the truths of God's word. And, and in this ministry, we get to glean truth and wisdom and understanding from this experience. This method has been used throughout the Bible from Moses to Joshua, from Paul to Timothy. From me to my children. To my bride. To those that would listen. You see, I'm reminded of Proverbs 27, verse 17, where it says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Isn't that beautiful? You see, as we walk with one another in Christ and share in the ministry, the blessing that comes from such a relationship is that we sharpen one another in the word of God. And this is not one upmanship. See, that's the difference. I'm not trying to prove to you that I'm smarter than you and I know more than you. This is about us coming together and growing in the word and letting it manifest itself in our lives 
and that we become more useful to God and his service. And so it's in Philippians chapter four, verse six to seven, we see another method God uses to equip us and it's the prayer ministry. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Do y'all get that part? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This vital ministry exists across all methods of equipping, whether it's preaching, teaching, Bible study, personal study. This vital ministry crosses all of them in the equipping part. See, if you want to hear from God, then we need to learn how to communicate with him. Somebody needs to say something and know how to hear back from him. Prayer is the most powerful tool we have, and we are to use it throughout our life, our calling, and all through our circumstances. Somebody needs to say something. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. So something to note is whether our equipping comes through one or all of these methods, there's only one place where the equipment goes. The psalmist writes in Psalms 119, verse 11, these words, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, whether it's preaching or teaching or personal study, mentoring or prayer, we are to hide this equipping in our heart because that's the center of who we are. Lord, help me. Now, if you will, look back with me at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10a, and we will see that our equipping comes with authority. He says this to Jeremiah, see, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. Now, you got to realize this is a young man. He's telling this to 2020, 20, 20, 20, somewhere around off in that age. He's saying, today I have appointed you over nations and kingdoms. He doesn't come from a royal line. He doesn't come from anybody, right? He's just a person. Now, listen to what he says. God gave Jeremiah authority to speak for him when he put his word in his mouth. And Jeremiah was authorized by God to stand and speak to any and everyone. Somebody need to say something. He was to be able to speak to kings and princes and presidents and governors. Didn't make a difference who they were. And when we walk in our calling and are equipped with his word, there should be a boldness in us just like Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Because the same God has authorized us to speak to nations and kingdoms. See, you got to look, look at this. Paul shares in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20. He wanted this power. He says, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Do you know the ambassador carries the authority of the one who sent him? Yes. Come on now. See, we have to be prepared to stand up and speak up for the kingdom of God. Somebody needs to say something. I'm talking about how to be used by God this morning. And it's in verse 10b that we see the message God gave Jeremiah to speak. Now, here's the thing. Before we hit that word, God gave Jeremiah a very difficult message to deliver. He's not coming from some royal lineage or something like that. He's just a man that's going to be carrying a difficult message. Do y'all realize that for 40 plus years, he said the same thing over and 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 they still didn't get it. Forty plus years. Five kings went through. Five kings he went through. Listen to what he says. He says... The message he's supposed to deliver is to, to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And so Jeremiah's authority to speak was predicated on him declaring two messages the Lord had in store for Judah, one of judgment and the second of restoration. That was his two messages. Jeremiah's message of judgment and restoration is very similar, by the way, to our message of repentance and salvation. You see, here's why. Because if there is no repentance, then there is judgment. And if there is re re repentance, then there is restoration. And then there is also salvation. Somebody should say something. Mm -hmm. 
Because 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says this, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and will turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Do you know that statement still holds true today? You see, the message of our calling isn't difficult to understand. Y'all ready for the difficult part? But often we find the audience God gives us to speak to is the challenge. Somebody say something. See, because we got some family members, some co-workers, some folks we work with in the community, all sorts of things that we need to be able to speak the truth to, but we're afraid. Huh? See, the, our, 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 the message of our calling isn't difficult to understand. The difficulty is the audience upon which God is sending us to speak. And it's in verse, verses 11 through 12 that we see God confirming Jeremiah's call. He says, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? He says, I see the branch of an almond tree. I replied, the Lord said to me, you see, you have seen correctly, for I have wa- I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Now, here's I want you to just pause for a moment. When God speaks to him to confirm what he's seeing. Do you all know what's taking place? So. There are times when the spirit comes to you and it says, do that little voice is talking to you and you still don't do it. This time the voice came to him and God says, OK, now tell me, what do you see? Because he's validating with him that you are on the same sheet of music with me. And he tells him what God put in his spirit in the vision to see. And he tells him what it is. And God says, you are correct. You have seen right. Isn't that beautiful? There was a confirmation from God in the experience, right? And so we have to be, and I love it because the authority that was given to this young man was beautiful. It was one of judgment and the second of restoration. See, Jeremiah's message was just, ooh, my God. And then the Lord confirmed Jeremiah's calling through two visions. The first was the branch of an almond tree, right? You see, the significance of the almond tree was this. It is the first tree to bloom in the spring. And it symbolized God's preparedness or readiness to fulfill his word concerning Judah. So he was validating, I'm I'm ready to do it now. It wasn't going to be six months from now, 60 years from now. I'm ready to do it now. And it's in verses 13 to 14, we see the second part of God's confirmation of the message with Jeremiah was to carry he says the word of the Lord came to me again he says what do you see he says I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north I answered verse 14 the Lord said to me from the north disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land do you realize that that's a difficult message to tell people disaster is coming if you don't change disaster who are you who are you to be telling me anything because that's what he's going to get but he still, was, he still has a job to do, to tell the world, if you don't change, disaster is coming. But if you change, restoration is waiting for you. Is that not still the same message today? You see, the second vision of the boiling pot revealed to Jeremiah the direction from which Judah's destruction would come from. And he confirmed the message of judgment and restoration for them. So y'all probably have heard, I know I have, I'm, I'm old, been in church forever. It's been a beautiful thing. But you probably heard, the, some of you may have heard the statement, uh, like fire shut up in my bones. Mm-hmm. You've heard in songs and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Jeremiah is the one who said it. And here's what happened. Jeremiah had been preaching and teaching, telling people to change, to change. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Please change, begging and pleading all these times. Five different kings he's been saying this to, right? And he gets discouraged. And he says, I'm going to go home and sit down. And he went home and tried to sit down. And he said it was like fire. Shut up in his bone because you can't sit down on what God gave you to do. He had to be useful. He had to be useful. 
And so here's the thing. We're closing. God used and protected Jeremiah all the days of his life. Not a day one. Remember last week he talked about that he was going to protect him? So if all you got to do, if you hadn't read the book of Jeremiah, please take the time. 14 times God saved him. 14. And Jeremiah was useful to God. And so as we close, the question is, are you ready to be used by God? Let us pray. Mighty loving Father, once again, God, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word, God. I pray that all that was shared here this morning was acceptable in thy sight. Master, I thank you for just spending this time with me, even in, as I struggled with all sorts of things, and you know what they are, to give me clarity to, to pin such a, an encouragement, Master. And I pray, Father, that as this seed, this good seed from your word went forward, I pray that it fell on fertile soils of hearts and minds, and God, that it would take root and that it would bring forth a brumpa crop of good fruit. And God, even now, as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place, but never your sight, I just want to remember a couple things, God. I want to lift up the Whitehurst family as we prepare to celebrate Mother's life on tomorrow. God, that you would uh, encamp your angels around this family. Give us all strength as we go through this celebration of life. God, I want to thank you for touching my brother, uh, Valet Lee, and uh, touching his body and uh, restoring his strength. I thank you for his bride that continues to pray for him and look out over him, Master. God, I just thank you for being who you are. I pray for um, my friends at DJ Safety that just lost uh, one of their loved ones to COVID, Master. I'm praying, God, that you would help. The racing community is being rocked by the issues of COVID right now. We've lost three, I think, in the last three weeks, as a matter of fact, key people. Uh, that's been very instrumental and has helped a lot of people. So God, you know all these things, but Master, I just, I'm bringing this petition before you, interceding on their behalf, God, and just praising you in advance for you being who you are. And God, even as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place, but never your sight, Father, go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we shall come together again. And we'll be forever careful that I was going to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? amen and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Continue to wear your mask, safe distancing. Do whatever you got to do as we try to get the situation under control. Look forward to seeing you next week.